All right. So welcome. Um, I want to talk about the 3B2 uh, desktop uh, Unix computer from the uh, early mid 80s made by AT&T. Um, why you've probably never heard of it and uh, some of you might have and why I still care about it at all. Um, and while I'm talking, please feel free to interrupt, raise a hand, whatever. We'll make it as interactive as possible. So when you think about Unix systems from the 80s and 90s, you probably think about these guys. There were others, um, SGI Sun, HP, IBM, AIX. Uh, but you probably don't think so much about AT&T, even though they invented Unix, right? Um, but the, they did have a, a, a Unix server market. The 3B2 was their best-selling small Unix system from 1984 to 1993. Um, it's relatively unknown today, and maybe during this talk we'll find out why. So we're going to begin with just a little look back at the history and an overview of the system um, in part one. And then part two, I'll talk about how you can uh, run 3B2 software today. So to start, this is a picture of a 3B2 300. That's the thing on the right. Um, it was the first 3B2 model that they released. Um, it looks like a workstation, but it's not a workstation. It was actually uh, targeting what I guess we would call today the small workgroup server market. Um, where you were going to host maybe two to 16 users at the same time on it. Um, there were other 32-bit Unix systems at the time, but this was actually one of the smallest that you could get in 1984. Um, used a custom CPU that was made by Western Electric called the WE32000. And next to it on the left is a terminal made by Teletype called the 5620. And that's running a windowing system called Layers, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. All right, but before we talk about the 3B2, I want to talk a little bit about Unix and AT&T's role in creating Unix. Um, so Unix was and is obviously a very influential operating system. Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson uh, collaborated to create Unix at AT&T Bell Labs in the early 1970s. Um, they were doing a lot of research at the time on all kinds of subjects. Computers and operating systems were just one of them. And they were working on an operating system called Multix together with GE and MIT. Um, and Dennis and Ken were kind of getting frustrated with how slow the progress on Multix was going. So they decided just kind of as a spare time project to work on an operating system of their own so they could hack on it. And, uh, as we know, there is nothing as permanent as a temporary fix. It is still around. So um, starting in 1975, AT&T began to license Unix to universities. And a little bit later, they started to license it to corporations like uh, Unisoft, who then ported it to uh, Sun, HP, and digital computers, among others. Um, but during this whole period, AT&T could not sell computers themselves because they were under a 1956 antitrust consent decree that said that they could not sell computers. And then this happened. Uh, in the early 80s, the uh, federal government broke up AT&T. They lost their monopoly protection and effective January 1st, 1984, they were split up, uh, which obviously was you know, sent shockwaves through the industry, but it meant that AT&T could sell computers. And they actually entered the market immediately. As soon as the consent decree, uh, as soon as the consent decree was up, they had models ready to go. Um, so the 3B2-300 that I showed at the beginning, that was the first small Unix system that they released. But they actually had a whole lineup uh, called the 3B line. This 3B2 was just the smallest of them. That was the one that was filling that work group niche, as I, as I mentioned. So this was the 3B lineup. The 3B20 on the left was a sort of a, what they called a super mini. Um, they actually ended up getting used a lot in telephone switches. Um, 
it was meant sort of if you needed a lot of processing or a lot of users. It didn't really get a lot of take up in sort of the corporate world, but it did find a lot of use in telephone switches. And the thing on the right is a 3B5. And uh, that one is a complete mystery. <laughs> Virtually nothing about it survives. Like I, this is the only picture I've ever seen of one. Um, I've never seen one in person. I've never known anyone who's seen one in person. So if you have one, let me know. I would love to look inside of it. <laughs> um, and the 3B2 in the middle was, as I said, they're super micro. And that started at about $10,000 in 1984 dollars. Uh, and that was successful enough that you can actually still find them today. Uh, I have three of them. Um, so. All three of them used um, what is called the WE32000 chipset. Uh, the CPU and the supporting chips were made by Western Electric. And I'm going to just, I'm not going to make you read this, this uh, diagram, but I am going to sort of do a very, very quick run through of what the architecture looks like. Um, in some ways, it's, it's kind of VAX like if, you, if you've ever worked with a VAX. If you squint hard enough, the WE32K kind of looks VAX-like. Uh, it was designed from the get-go to support C and Unix-like operating systems. So it was fully 32-bit on a single IC, which was pretty cool at the time. It had uh, 16 registers, nine general purpose and seven special purpose registers, including the program counter was one of them that you could access, which is pretty cool. And you could access both registers and memory in byte, half word, or word orienta uh, orientation. So you could access 32 bits, 16 bits, or 8 bits at a time. Uh, and they had to be aligned accesses. So you couldn't like read an odd numbered address to get a 32 bit word. Um, they also supported an MMU and a floating point math accelerator. So the uh, WE32101 was the MMU, and the 32106 was the floating point math accelerator. It was a IEEE 754 draft support. And one of the cool features, at least I think is cool, is that it had hardware support for Unix process switching. So if you wanted to switch processes in Unix, you could just call one instruction that would stick this whole structure somewhere in the stack. And then when you switch back, it would restore the state just with one instruction. Unfortunately, it was kind of slow. Um, the system itself was using mostly off-the-shelf parts, except for the CPU, the MMU, and the floating point accelerator. So most of these things were just standard parts that you could just buy from whatever your vendor of choice was. And one other thing that I should mention is it supported what are called intelligent feature cards. Um, these were how you expanded it. So if you wanted to add more terminals, for example, this is a, called a ports card. So you could add four terminals and one parallel port. Um, the uh, it was a standard architecture that was all based around the 8186, strangely enough. So this was a whole single board computer. Every expansion card was a single board computer with between 32 and 64K of RAM, some ROM, and a CPU. And it communicated with the system uh, over DMA and using interrupts. So what did you get for $10,000? You got System 5 release 2 Unix. You got the 32K CPU and MMU. Uh, half a meg of RAM, which was at the, in the beginning upgradable to two megabytes. Um, later on, it could be upgraded to four megabytes. Uh, one 10 megabyte MFM hard disk, which you could, if you had deep enough pockets, upgrade to 32 megabytes. Uh, one 720K floppy drive. Uh, two RS-232 serial ports for terminals, terminals sold separately, uh, room for four intelligent feature cards, uh, which meant you could expand it up to 18 terminals because there were two terminals built into the system, two uh, serial ports built into the system. 
And how was it received in 1984? Oh, yes. Uh, that previous one had a 186 or a one Yeah, this one. Was that like the price for the previous one? It was, yeah, it, it was essentially an 80. 80. Is it 80? Yeah, it was an 8086 system. It's, it, it was um, primarily targeted at embedded systems, but it was in that 8086 line. It was like between the 8088 and the 8286. So it it was it was x86 instruction set. Yep. Right. It was its own weird thing. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, how was it received? Um, well, it turns out it was not actually a smash hit at Bell Labs. They were still working on Unix um, research at the time, and so I asked some of the people who were there for their reactions and their recollections of it. Uh, and Rob Pike said, it was not popular with CS research and we were not popular with AT&T sales. We were using VAXs, which the 3B series were attempting to compete against, but the 3B series was clumsier and less cost effective. And John P. Linderman said, we were, quote, gifted a 3B2, as in, take this and use it. I ran a PS command in single user mode and it took 20 seconds to run. Our machine names were themed around bird names, so we christened the 3B2 Junko. And unfortunately, it was not a smash hit in the marketplace at first either. Clem Cole, an early Unix developer, said, I've often said the only reason they sold any of them was that AT&T required you to buy one as the reference system for SVR3. So anyone who wanted to port it tended to buy one 3B2 just to have it as a reference box. So, yeah. Oh, the HP Integral. That, that was a much later system, wasn't it? That was, was it 84? Yeah. I'm not familiar enough with the Integral to know. Uh, was that, what CPU was it using? Do you know? Um, I think it was 68K, but it was. 68K would make sense. Um, yeah, it was Unix based, so it was HP US. Okay. It was probably in a very similar marketplace, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't think it was that. It was more, you know, the consumer, it was actually a portable. Oh, okay. Oh, I remember what you're talking about now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, it was a tough sell, right? You get, you trade $10,000 for a very slow computer. Nevertheless, thankfully, they persisted. Um, momentum started to change a little bit when Unix System 5 Release 3, the follow-up to Release 2, came out. It was around 1985, and um, they decided to make the 3B2 the base porting platform for Unix uh, System 5 Release 3. And what that meant was, as Clem Cole mentioned in his quote, uh, if you wanted to port System 5 Release 3 to any other architecture, you needed a 3B2 because that's where the tools were. You needed to have the cross compilers and the kernel source and everything was written for the 3B2. So that sort of started to change momentum a little bit. Uh, 1985 also saw the release of the 3B2 310 and the 3B2 400. The 310 was just an upgraded 3B2 300, exact same case, same power supply, same parts, except it had a faster CPU. And the 400, which is shown here, um, was a 310 in a bigger case with a built-in 60 megabyte tape drive and up to two internal MFM disks uh, and eight feature card slots instead of four. So in theory, you could run up to 34 users, but it maxed out at four megabytes, so that would have been really painful. And they kept going. In 1987, they introduced the 3B2 600 with a base price of $46,000, which I checked adjusted for inflation is about 120,000 now. Yeah. Um, internally, it was a significantly different memory layout, but it used all the same components. So they basically just shuffled the memory map around so that you could actually add and address more memory. Um, and it had a clock bump on the CPU up to 18 megahertz. 
and more models followed. So in 1989, they introduced the 3B2-1000, and that was available in various configurations up to 22 megahertz. And um, I think, yeah, 12 feature card slots. So if we look at the architecture for the 3B2-600 and the 3B2-1000, what you get is System 5 release 3 and 4 Unix, um, W32-100 and 32-200 CPUs that were running at 18 or 22 megahertz, between 8 megabytes and 64 megabytes of RAM, um, one to three internal SCSI disk drives, up to 600 megs each, and of course, external disk drives could be added. Uh, 120 meg SCSI tape disk was standard, still the same 720K floppy drive, but it had room for 12 feature cards. And uh, critically, they also introduced feature cards for Ethernet, and they had TCP IP support, thanks to uh, third party Wollongong group. Um, and I think other TCP IP stacks came along later. Naming at this point got a little confusing. So this is the 3B2600G, but it's really just a 3B2-1000 with a different name badge on it. Um, this was targeted at the federal government. And uh, that is sort of what led to the success sort of late in the game, is that even though it never saw a lot of commercial success with business, they did see a lot of success with the federal government, the military, and telephone companies. They all sort of embraced it. In fact, interestingly enough, the 3B2-1000 saw a lot of deployment during Desert Storm in 1991. It was, uh, they were like all over Saudi Arabia. Uh, there was a story I just read about how um, during deployment they dropped, I think, a crate of five of them off of one of the planes as they were unloading it. So it fell about, I don't know, 16 feet. And they plugged them in and they still worked. So they, they did have something going for them. And sort of the end of the road for the 3B2 line came in the early 90s. So in 91, AT&T bought NCR. And they started moving support for the 3B2 over to NCR. And by the end of 1992, NCR was providing incentives to migrate away from 3B2s and over to NCR systems. And the last 3B2 came off the assembly line in 1993. So was it a failure? No, not really. It saw enough commercial success to not quite be a failure, but I don't know that you would call it a smashing success either. It never really penetrated the overall business market. It never caught on and, and went on into the mid-90s or late-90s as a viable system. What about the electrical No, it did not. Uh, it was used under protest inside AT&T. Um, and later on, they just sort of abandoned it. The, there was uh, an experiment. The last few generations of 3B2 could be upgraded to a MIPS CPU, but I think no one did that. I think maybe a couple of people experimentally did it, um, but that was obviously a whole different operating system at that point. Um, but anyways, let's change the, oh yeah, sir. So I have a 3B1. Oh, 3B1, so yes. Yes. Yep. How did that happen? Or is that too large? No, no, that, that was part of the part of the strategy when they entered the computer market in 1984 was it was a three-pronged approach. Um, they had the 3B2, uh, 3B line. They had the 3B1, which was kind of a nickname. It was the PC 7300 technically. PC. Yeah, or the, the AT&T Unix PC, which was, um, I believe, made by Olivetti. Uh, or no, 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 I was wrong. I think it's uh, Convergent Technologies made the 3B1. Yes, they have their That's right. And um, then there was also the PC 6300, which was somewhat IBM PC compatible. So they tried to enter the market kind of three different ways and kind of failed three different ways, unfortunately. It was mainly being used for controlling telephone switches. So what they ended up doing was selling telephone switches and then saying, oh, by the way, you have to buy a 3B2 to run it. 
Um, but anyway, let's change topics real quick and uh, talk about the terminal that you saw at the beginning, which, because I think it's actually kind of cool in its own right. So this is a DMD 5620 terminal. Uh, DMD is short for dot map display. And it was produced uh, by Teletype Corporation, uh, which was a subsidiary of Western Electric, which was itself a subsidiary of AT&T. Convenient. Um, and this was the commercial version of a research terminal that was designed by Rob Pike and Bart Lacanthe at Bell Labs in 1982. Um, and just as a quick aside, that funky mouse that looks like a ladybug was made by a Swiss company called Depraz, and they're actually kind of fun to use. They're very clicky. Um, they were first released in 1980, uh, and they were, I think they were the first commercially available mouse, as in not something that was sold with a system, but you could just buy one. Um, but AT&T standardized on these for the 5620. But anyways, the early Bell Labs research in 1982 um, was inspired by this, the Perk workstation from Three Rivers Computer Corporation. Uh, this was sold by Three Rivers from, I guess, the late 70s through the early 80s. And it used a bitmap display and a graphical user interface, kind of like, very much like a Xerox Alto. Um, That's all micro Yeah, it was, very, it was a very cool workstation. And Rob Pike and Bart Lacanthe saw this and were like, well, you know, we would love something like this, but for Unix. And so that's what inspired their research. Uh, and the name kind of has a funny history because they liked the name Perk so much that they nicknamed it Jerk, just because they have a fun sense of humor. Um, but AT&T did not like that. <laughs> so they uh, instead changed the internal name to Blit after the bit blit algorithm that they used to copy chunks of video memory very quickly. Um, but AT&T still didn't like that. They weren't gonna market that. So they said, no, 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 dot map display. And interestingly, the research versions, everything before the DMD 5620, they all used a Motorola 68000 as the CPU. But AT&T said, no, we're gonna use our own CPU. So when it came time to actually design the DMD they standardized around the WE32K. So that's the other place that it found some use was inside these terminals. Um, and they really did not like that at Bell Labs. They were very frustrated because they were all 68K hackers and they did not like the 32K very much. So what was it like to use? It actually had two modes. You could run um, straight up as a plain text terminal uh, with just portrait display, it was 88 by 66, I think, characters. Um, or if you ran a program called Layers, uh, you could enter this graphics mode, and that let you run multiple terminals that multiplexed basically virtual PTYs over one serial line. So you could have uh, multiple text terminals, but you could also run little applications. And these were all running not on the host CPU, or on the host computer, but on the terminal itself. So it would download a chunk of memory into the terminal and start running it on the terminal's WE32K CPU. Uh, and actually using it was kind of interesting because everything was menu driven through this one menu that you could get if you right clicked the mouse anywhere on the background. And you could create a new window or reshape or move windows. And kind of unlike modern windowing systems, uh, if you wanted to do an, uh, take an action on a window, you would select the action that you wanted to perform, then click on the window that you wanted to apply the action to. Then if you wanted to say reshape it, you would draw out a new window area for it to live in. And then it would redraw the window there. Um, so it was, it was maybe a little clunky by modern standards, but you know, it was kind of interesting. And a lot of this stuff went on to inspire um, similar things in the Plan 9 operating system at Bell Labs, so if you've ever heard of that. So later on, in the, by the early 90s, the 5620 was kind of getting long in the tooth. It was a little 
obsolete. So they replaced it with the 630 and the 730 MTG terminals. Um, they were not portrait display, they were four by three. And unfortunately, they're really hard to find pictures of. I don't have one, I, I don't really know anyone with one. And, oh, you have one. Oh, there you go. So next time I'll ask you for pictures. Um, but yeah, they're, they're I, interestingly enough, they switched back to the 68K for those. I guess by that time they knew that the writing was on the wall for the 32K. So that brings us right back to where we started. Um, yeah. Yeah. There was, yeah. You would actually, there was a whole development kit. So you would cross compile, it was the same CPU, so that made it easy. But you would compile specifically for the 32K architecture, the um, Blit architecture, and use a, a loader called 32LD to load it onto the terminal. So yeah, uh, I think it was a pretty innovative combo for 1984. It was maybe ahead of its time in some ways and behind the times in other ways. Did you remember Patera? No. Oh, that was like a desktop PDP-11. It was a bitmap, a memory map, uh, bitmap display. Kind of oh, a bitmap display PDP-11. That is interesting. Yeah, so. But yeah, I think it was a pretty interesting combo. Um, and now on to part two. So how do you run 3B2 software in 2022? Well, as I said, you can still buy them. They do appear sometimes. I think I've seen like three on eBay in the last eight years. So they do appear sometimes. Um, but wouldn't it be more fun to write an emulator? So that's what I ended up doing. So sometime in kind of early 2014, I think, is when I first became aware of the 3B2. Um, it was, I think it was in relation to the SDF public access Unix system, because they used to run their public access Unix system on a spare 3B2, like a surplus 3B2. Um, I thought it sounded neat, so I wanted to see what it was like to play with one, but I had no luck finding one. Uh, and I looked around for an emulator and I couldn't find one of those too. So I thought, hey, I could write an emulator. How hard could it be? And normally when you start writing an emulator, you gather up all the documentation, all the schematics, all the reference materials, service manuals, anything you get your hands on. But I could find none of that. At first, literally all I had to go on was this picture from Wikipedia. That is, the top is an MMU, and the bottom is a CPU, and then the unpopulated slot there is the uh, floating point unit, which was optional. So I just started by trying to identify all the different parts that I could see, and then I sent out this email, which I'm not gonna make you read, uh, in, I guess, late November 2014, just begging people for help. Hey, if you know how the 3B2 works, please get in touch with me because I don't know how it works. And for some reason, I wanna write an emulator. All right, but nobody had any answers. Um, some people that I talked to knew what a 3B2 was. Some even had one, but nobody had any like internals documentation or any kind of like schematics or anything like that. So eventually, I did find someone who was willing to dump the contents of ROM for me. So um, thanks, Alan Hightower, wherever you are. Um, he was gracious enough to get the ROMs that were in sockets, thankfully, out of his 3B2310 and dump the binary contents. Um, and the, the ROM in the 3B2 is actually pretty fancy. It does a lot of like diagnostics and stuff before you boot, and it has a whole little not, not quite a monitor program, but enough of a, a bootstrap program that you can interact with to, to, to work around in the system a little bit. So I figured that has got to be useful. The problem is, how do you figure out what's on the ROM if you don't already have a 3B2 with the tools that would let you decompile the ROM? So uh, I 
normally you'd use a disassembler, and there is a disassembler on the 3B2, but like I said, I didn't have a 3B2, and no one that I knew had a 3B2 with the disassembler tools, so I had to start by writing a disassembler. It's not fun. Luckily, one of the few pieces of information that I did have uh, was the 32100 microprocessor information manual. This was on bit savers. And um, it describes in gory details how the CPU works, all the opcodes, what they do in, in wonderful detail. So that was enough of a clue for me to write the disassembler. And that's what I did. I wrote the disassembler, went through the code that it spit out line by line trying to piece together what it was doing. I added a ton of comments as I went. Um, and that was helpful. It was very helpful, but it didn't get me far enough. In fact, I was kind of stuck. And then someone much smarter than me said, hey, have you looked at the Unix source code at all? Because I had forgotten, yes, it was the base porting platform for System 5 Release 3. So the Unix source code, which should be in mostly in C, but some in WE32K assembly, would have so much detail. And that was exactly the right thing to do. Um, luckily, that code had survived. It was on the Unix Historical Society website. So I could download the 3B2 version of the System 5 Release 3 source code and go through that. And yeah, it was everything that I, pretty much everything that I needed was in there. It gave me a huge leg up in figuring out what was what, how things were laid out, both in C and in assembly. Um, so that sort of showed me how things were connected. And then eventually, I did track down not only the CPU documentation, but also the rest of the chipset documentation. Some of that was on bit savers, but a lot of it I got just by begging over and over and over on various mailing lists until people were like, oh yeah, I think I do have that in a box somewhere. Um, and that proved sort of invaluable. And the other thing that was uh, very difficult but a huge victory was figuring out how the memory management unit worked uh, because that was, that was kind of a, a fun challenge because I had never written an emulator for an MMU before. I sort of kind of vaguely knew how they worked, but I wasn't really a systems guy before this. So learning how the MMU mapped physical to virtual memory was kind of amazing to me. Um, but even with all of that, I kind of eventually ran out of steam and I kind of made it part way and it was kind of fits and starts. Uh, I made it as far as I could without having an actual 3B2 to test things on. So uh, my friend Ian over in Seattle had one. He had it in storage. He was able to dig it out for me and uh, he gave it to me to examine. And um, I warned him what I was gonna do to it I dug into it with logic analyzer and went to town, uh, just probing here and there, and this helped tremendously, right? Like I was able to take a detailed look at what the uh, hard drive uh, controller was doing, for example. Uh, I was able to see what the interrupts were doing, because even though the source code sort of told me what interrupts were used for what, um, nothing told me how those interrupts were handled at the hardware level, how they propagated through the system. So I had to kind of figure it all out for myself. Uh, and ironically and frustratingly, I found the 3B2 technical reference manual probably when I was about um, three months away from having a working system. So I didn't get to use this to help me that much, except I got to go through it and say, oh yeah, this is what I thought it was doing, and I guess I was right here, I was a little bit wrong here. So this, this was great to have, but um, I wish I had had it earlier. And then there's the question of how do you emulate those expansion cards? Because those are single board computers. And you know, that was a particular difficulty, because you could actually go and emulate an 8186 CPU and the RAM and the ROM and use the firmware and stuff, but that just seemed like a nightmare. So I just treated them as black boxes. I saw what the computer was asking them to do, and then I just intercept that and I pretend to be that card. 
and give it, give it back the information that it wants. Um, and luckily, to help with that, uh, I was able to find the driver design guide. And you see, it says 3B5 computer driver design guide. That's like the only other reference to the 3B5 that I've ever seen. <laughs> um, so apparently they used the same expansion cards, and that's all I know. Uh, but yeah, with that and with the System 5 source code, I was able to sort of piece together how all of that worked and get the emulated system working with the emulated cards. Um, and around that time, it was also when I was trying to figure out what framework to write all this in, right? Because I didn't want to have to do all the boilerplate emulator code, like how you accept input from the user and send it to the emulated system and how you allow people to inspect memory and stuff like that. So uh, I eventually went with something called SimH, which is an open source computer history simulation project. Um, I did look at MAME as an option, because that's pretty popular. But MAME offers a lot of stuff that I didn't need, especially like graphic support, because the 3B2 never had any built-in graphics. So I didn't need most of what MAME had to offer. Uh, and SimH just seemed like a better fit. Uh, and SimH is all on GitHub in the, in the open SimH repository. So if you ever want to play with it, um, my emulator is in there, and a bunch of other emulators are all part of it you know, a um, bunch of deck stuff. So if you ever want to play with a PDP 11 or VAX, excellent simulators for it. So eventually, I was able to boot and run System 5 Release 3. This is System 5 uh, 3.2, system, system 5 Release 3.2 running. And uh, it was quite the challenge. It was not an overnight success. I know it, it sounds kind of quick in a talk like this, but uh, it was actually about four to five years of working on and off on it to, before I got it to the point where it could actually run System 5. Um, but it was incredibly satisfying to get it to work. Okay. And, but there's one more thing. The DMD5620, DMD I wrote an emulator for that too because it's cool enough that I think it, it needed to be preserved and not everyone has access to a blit. So this simulator, it turns out, was a lot easier to write. This was like a month or two of work, ironically, because I already had the WA32K figured out, and this system is so much better documented. Like, you can get all the schematics, the technical information, everything is preserved online, which was fantastic, all the ROMs and stuff. Um, so without that, I think this would have been kind of a nightmare to do too, but it ended up being pretty straightforward actually. So I wanted to end by sharing some links. Um, this is where you can find more information about both the 3B2 and the emulators. Um, both the, the uh, 3B2 emulator and the Blit emulator. And I just wanted to open it up to Q&As. Oh, and let me go back to that. I see some people trying to take pictures. Are the numbers in the ATP and the ATP very tight about controlling the source code? Yes. I imagine at some point you were able to get it. And what, what was the uh, transition? Uh, the yeah, access to the source code. It's kind of a gray area because a lot of, a lot of the source code has been open sourced by the various IP holders. But it's not even really clear who has the IP for the AT&T source code anymore. It went from AT&T to, oh, I'm gonna get this wrong. Um, it ended up with like the SEO group and then they got bought by, I don't remember who bought them. Microware or somebody like that, I think. But they, it's sort of this absolute gray area right now. Like I don't, I don't know who to approach about. For example, if I want, I, I don't redistribute the source code. But if I did, like, who would I ask for permission? But somebody archived it. On somebody archived it. Yeah, it's it's been archived on um, both BitSavers and the TUHS website. Um, so it's out there. And the question is, does, does the actual rights holder 
know or care? And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. It's, it's kind of a, it's, it's an interesting question. Like I would love to be 100% above board and say, yes, we have permission to distribute the source code. Uh, and it's kind of the same with the binaries, right? Like I don't, I don't even include the ROM file that you need with the source code for this. Um, it's easy enough to get, but just for legal reasons, I just don't include it with the source code. Start with the LLC and let's see if you get sued. Yeah, that's probably how you do it. See if you get sued. <laughs> right. All right, so you were able to talk to them for the Solaris stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right. But I, right, right. Yeah, um, I know somebody bought SEO, the assets of SEO, um, but Right, they don't, like what is, what is their, what are they doing with that license, I don't know. Get a question? What are the other unit systems for around at the same time? Because I mean, it went away once you said like, it meant three years ago? Yeah, it went around. Are there other ones available for other companies? Oh yeah, um, by, Linux. actually that's true, by 93 Linux was already kind of on the rise, but um, the big players were like Sun Microsystems, Silicon Graphics, Hewlett Packard, IBM. yeah, IBM had AIX. Yeah, AIX was not. I, I cut my teeth on AIX a little bit. Um, Digital had Ultrix. Um, yeah. Oh, that's right. Apollo. Apollo had Domain OS, uh, and then they went to HPUX, I think. Right. I think, oh, Unicos, that's right. That was another one that was around at the time. Yeah, SEO, SEO Unix, uh, I think they were targeting the 386 mostly. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. So there, it was kind of a healthy marketplace uh, by the early 90s, but I just don't think that AT&T was interested in trying to compete anymore. It was kind of, I, I'm sure it was kind of a, a money sink for them by that point. You mentioned this was a huge effort, like five years. Yeah. And you mentioned that you were going to talk about your motivation for doing this. My, there was something about public access. Uh, my, my motivation for doing this, yeah. um, the original thing that caused me to want to look at this at all was the SDF public access Unix right. system, um, which is I've had an account there for like a decade and a half, I think. And um, they used to run on a 3B2, and I think they had like a couple of 3B2s for a while. Um, then they moved everything over to deck alpha for a long time, and now they're just on com you know commodity PC boxes. So they're still there. They're a really cool place if you want a, a free public access Unix shell. Um, they're kind of old school like that. I like it a lot. Yeah, any other questions? At the time, did you, I guess, were you aware that this was one of the most computer and all that stuff? Like, I mean, 3D2, and I'm sure you probably visited it. Right, yeah. Um, I ended up visiting, um, gosh, pretty early on. Uh, I did end up, they, they have an, a, they had an account that you could get on the 3B2 1000. So I ended up getting an account on there. They had no developer tools or anything, so I couldn't like hack around on it too much, but um, it was still fun to use it as just a user system. Well, now, now of course, they're closed, there's nothing that happened, but they did actually use the terminal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could go over and play with the Blit terminal there too. Um, I think they, so SDF, sometimes spins up this emulator to let people play with like the old 3B2 system, which is kind of fun. How's the performance compared to the original? Oh, it's, it tries to be as accurate to timing as possible. So it actually feels pretty, pretty real, except the, for PS. <laughs> that, that's an actually an interesting point. The 20 seconds for a PS command, that is pretty much true, 
the first time you run it. It actually creates like a bunch of virtual devices the first time that you run PS. So if you run it again later, it's much faster. But yeah, it's a terrible user experience the first time you run it. Yeah, I think the Living Computer Museum has enough of the lights turned on that you can still get accounts on some of the systems. Yeah, the, the later the later systems were okay. I um, philosophically don't like System Five Unix very much, just because I'm used to the having all the niceties of the BSD sublayers and stuff. But so not really a question, but um, I have I was running layers on my EMP on my um, um, on SBSD because ah yes. Yeah, yeah, I should point that out. You you can actually run layers not just on System 5 Unix on a 3B2. There was um, not, it wasn't called layers, it was called MUX, but on Research Unix that came out of Bell Labs. So if you're running Research Unix B8, you can just run MUX, and that will work on the terminal as well. There's also a software package. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know about that. So if you run, if you look for DMD layers, you can find a... DMD layers, yeah. I, um, I was running it for years on SBSD, and um, a few months ago, I pulled it down onto my Raspberry Pi, and it didn't compile, and I just stepped away. <laughs> and, um, but it's one of these days I'm going to get it running on my Pi. So. Cool. Cool. Okay, I'm going to have to look for DMD layers, because I've never, I've never tried this on anything but an emulated system. So if you, if you run... Uh, V8 Unix on a VAX, you can also use the blit with that. I can't definitely say that, but I know that it worked on, uh, on NetBSD. Mm. I can emphatically say that it worked on NetBSD and probably other BSD units. So that's cool, DMD layers, I will look for that. Just, just FYI, the cool thing to do apparently with Raspberry Pi is to choose where to paste the just like the hidden computer. <laughs> so everyone... That's it, I'm going to have to print, I'm going to have to 3D print. Uh, 3B2 case for Raspberry Pi. Yeah. So a lot of the computers last for a lot longer than full. I think they would last for a lot. What's the last reference did you see for like the Tom Calendar? Oh, right. The last. So the last time that I think a telecom actually used any of this stuff um, is pretty recent. So one interesting thing is that. When they moved to the, and I'm going to get this wrong because I'm not really a telecom guy, but the 5ESS switch, telephone switch, that ran as recently as like at least a decade ago, ran a, a simulated 3B20 on a Sun system. So you would get like a Sun Netra T1 and it would run a simulated 3B20 and that would control your switch. Yeah. Yeah, there, there is a Y2K kit for the 3B2. <laughs> so you mentioned you developed this without hardware. Has that situation changed? Oh, yes. M mostly, most of it uh, I did develop without access to hardware, but then I got loaned a system, like I, I showed the pictures of probing that, uh, and then uh, I found one on eBay that I bought for not too much money, and then because of all the work and me constantly pestering people for information, I ended up with like three or four more just because they were like, I'm not using this, you could probably use it better here, which is great. Um, I, I ended up with a 3B2 400 that has um, uh, debug ROMs in it, which I couldn't, yeah, I had seen references to, but I had never, I thought they were just gonna be unpreserved forever. But you can actually run the debug ROMs in the emulator now. And I do have a blit. That was that was much more expensive, and it involved a trip to the Bay Area from here. But it was it was worth it, including the mouse. Including the mouse, yeah. Have you been into games for this year or something like that? I haven't, but you know there are so games. There are some games available for the blit. Um, 
I forget what what the name of there's there's like um oh, there's one where you're like fighting corporate entities I think that's kind of like kind of like X Bill but not if you remember X Bill the game uh, and there's one called Crabs that just like little crabs eat your display um, but that's actually would be kind of a fun project is just write a game because we have all the tools now to do it. Uh, so it's reasonable to be able to do that. There was a Space Invaders and a Pac-Man. Oh, Space Invaders and Pac-Man. I didn't know about that. Oh, by the way, I found the GitHub repo for TMD Layers. And it runs on Max, Sun, CPI, Unisys, ICL, Harris, Alliance, and there are a couple of others that I remember. And basically it runs any BSD Unix. Any BSD Unix will run DMD Layers. OK, so, so that's cool. I wonder how hard that would be getting get how hard it would be to get that running on like a modern Linux. Worth a shot. Can you explain the relationship between the, the workstation and the, and the terminal again? Was it like you would compile it? Terminal yeah. Terminal? So if you wanted to write code for the DMD terminal, you had a whole development environment on the 3B2. You would, you know, write your code against their APIs and then compile it. And then, um, whenever you wanted to run anything on the terminal, there was a program called LD32, and that would take your object files um, linked together and then upload them to the terminal. And the terminal would sort of just suck it in byte by byte and put it somewhere in memory and then jump to it and start, you know, running it. It had a multitasking operating system of its own running in basically just out of ROM. Serial connection? Yeah, it was all serial connection. In fact, it's kind of difficult or tricky to use with uh, Telnet because they didn't anticipate Telnet control signaling over the link. So if you're on one system and you Telnet to another, um, it's going to eat some of your Telnet bytes uh, because it's using like FF is a valid character that it could send. So you have to put it in a special mode where it, it falls back to using hex instead of binary. What's the baud range? Uh, it could go up to 19.2. So, so the top, you're talking about telemetting the blip. Right. If you, were, if, you had, if you had a blip running on one system yeah. and you telemetted to another system from there and then ran layers, that's where it could fail, unless you put it in the special mode where. Yeah. The implication is there's OS running on the terminal, is that right? Yeah, um, it's it, it's more like just a multiplexer, really. I mean, it's there. I I don't know if I would call it a full blown operating system on the terminal, but there's enough of a there's enough of a process switching system in there and a scheduler that I guess you could call it an operating system. Like an off-the-shelf, why didn't they use an off-the-shelf, like? I think they just thought it was maybe the next big thing was going to be, it, it, in some ways, it's, it's really like a thin client, right? Like, it's, it's like a client-server architecture at that point, where, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there was a relationship between a lot of this research for the Blit terminal and Plan 9. Like spiritually, there was a lot of Blit and DMD stuff in the Plan 9 operating system, like a lot of it. Uh, but I don't know Plan 9 well enough to really to know exactly what came. Like they had a Blit emulator that didn't emulate this system. It emulated the 68,000 uh, jerk system. So you could run a software jerk on Plan 9. I know that. What was the reference system for Plan 9? I don't know what the reference system for Plan 9 was. That's a good question. So if, if you're in a repo, does anyone, I mean, pull requests or do any comments in here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So this is because. <laughs> 
since this is part of an upstream uh, project now, like it's more like I'm submitting pull requests to them all the time to take fixes for the 3B2. Um, so I have my own fork on GitHub that I do all my changes in, and then I, I issue a pull request upstream to open SimH, and they pull it in. There's there's a there's an open SimH steering group that I am part of now. <laughs> so. Um, uh, you know, there's there's a handful of 3B2 enthusiasts, but it's it's mostly like I, I'm in communication with like three or four people that use this. I don't anticipate very many people use this. I think maybe a small handful of people actually use this for mostly for nostalgia purposes, but I know a couple of people that are using it like for real as a fully up and running 3B2 that they can just jump into and use whenever they want to. I don't know why, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but again, I don't, I don't know who owns the IP. I don't think, because AT&T certainly doesn't. Yeah, I, I took a long break, but I've been working on a, an emulator for the Tech 4404, which is an AI emulator. Uh, sorry, an AI um, system from, I guess, the late 80s? Six, 68, yeah, it's a, it's a 68010 based system that ran, um, you could run Lisp on it, but also Smalltalk. It was mostly a Smalltalk system. And I also don't have one of those, so. <laughs> That's why that one has not gone very far either. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank this is a much bigger turnout than I expected.